We recently added this bonus room onto our house. We got this nice little wet bar, and then we got this weird little nook over here. We didn't really know what to do with this nook, and my wife had the idea that, oh, it could be a bed. But I gotta tell you, I laid down over there, and it was not comfortable at all. So I went out and bought a mattress and slid it in there. Maybe that's what she had in mind. I don't know. And although this made it much more comfortable, well, it just didn't really look all that nice. So that's when I had the brilliant idea to build a built-in bed slash day bed. I'm just joking, this was totally my wife's idea. Don't tell her I said it was mine. The first thing I did was mock up a design on SketchUp. This allowed me to get all the dimensions and measurements correct because the mattress isn't big enough to fit in the nook. It's a little short, so I'm gonna have to build this surround to hold the mattress and then a platform for the mattress to sit on. And then I thought if I'm building a platform, I might as well put some drawers under there. So I went to the lumber store. I got a wide variety of lumber. I'm gonna use a little poplar for face frames and trim, some MDF for all the painted surfaces, and then some three quarter inch birch ply for all my cabinet carcasses. So the first thing I had to do was start breaking down ply to build that surround that'll wrap around the bed on three sides. So I used the table saw to cut all my pieces to width, and then I used the track saw to easily cut them all to length. Once I had all my pieces broken down, well, I could start breaking down some more pieces, I guess. Forgot about this part. Now it wasn't gonna be enough just to wrap the three sides with three quarter inch plywood. It needed to be thicker than that. I basically need the walls on both sides to come in three inches so that my mattress fits nice and tight. So I'm gonna build these little false walls. So I ripped down a bunch of these thin strips of three quarter inch ply, and they're gonna be ribs or studs within that false wall surround thing. Now it would be easy to overthink this and over engineer it, but really you just need to shrink the walls in. So don't spend too much time on this. After cutting all my thin strips, I laid them out somewhat evenly, spaced apart, and then I just glued them in place with some CA glue. Now don't worry, this isn't gonna be the structural component of this wall. I'm just using the CA glue to get everything where it needs to go and stay put, and then I can flip the whole thing over and sink some screws in from the back to make it nice and sturdy. So I used my Festool track saw track as just a straight edge to line up my first piece, and then once I had that first piece secured down nice and tight with some CA glue, well, then I cut a little spacer out of plywood and I just worked my way across the piece, making sure they were all evenly spaced, more so that I could know where they are when I tack on my MDF face. But you don't need to know that yet because we haven't got there. Once I had all my pieces attached with the CA glue, like I said, I flipped the whole thing over so that the ribs were down and the back of the plywood was exposed. And just as I said, I sank in some screws. Now these ribs are secured nice and tight to my three quarter inch ply and we are ready to move on to the next step. What is the next step? Oh yeah, I remember. The next step is doing the exact same thing for the sides. They're just smaller. And basically it's gonna look like this. Just imagine that this is up in my bonus room and it's inside that little nook. I just kinda wanted to see what it was gonna look like so I mocked it up with clamps. And then, because it's YouTube, I did a nice little slow pan from the floor up so you could really immerse yourself in the story that I'm trying to tell. Now, before I could plop this thing into place, plop being a technical term, I had to do a little work to the nook. There was this outlet that I had to move because I didn't want to cover it up. So I tested to see if it was still on by holding a screwdriver up to the screws on the edge of it. I didn't shock myself, so I figured I'd flipped the right switch in the breaker. Next, I basically made that outlet a junction box, ran some new wire a little farther forward, and I'll add an outlet later down the road at some point. But don't worry, the power's still off, and I won't turn it back on until I get that wire capped off. For now, I cut away all the trim, and I started sliding my fake wall pieces into place. This is when I realized I did something kind of dumb. I took my measurement up higher on the wall and I didn't take a secondary measurement lower down. 
and sure enough, it's tighter at the bottom than it is at the top. So my back piece did not want to fit. So I got my multi-tool and figured, it's fine, I'll just trim a little off the edge, right where it is, and then slide it into place. That didn't work. So then I had to pull the whole thing back out, and like the true fine woodworker I am, I just carved away a bunch of it until it was nasty and ugly looking. But hey, it slid in there, it fit, and nobody's gonna see it. I did, however, make quite a mess. So you know what that means. And now it's time for my favorite tune, I'm Sweeping in My Socks. Are you ready? Here we go. Sweeping in my socks, sweeping in my socks. Everybody look at me, I'm sweeping in my socks. Now sweeping in a box, now sweeping with a fox. Everybody look at me, I'm sweeping in my socks. Ooh. With a Not fox with or in a Not box, in box. Just, just in my in socks. socks. I'm sweeping in my socks. Sometimes a man needs to sweep in his socks. I'm sweeping in my socks. Oh, lolly. I swept in my socks. socks. After successfully getting my back piece in, the two side pieces were pretty simple. I just slid them in there. Except for this right piece, because I realized this wall was way out of square. So I had to shim the top and bring it back into square. Or plumb. Plumb or square. I used a level, so it must be plumb. Anyways, I got it all situated nicely. Once it was all shimmed, I screwed both my sides tightly in place. And then I used the multi-tool to trim down my shims on the top and make everything nice and flat. And then before I forgot, I wanted to make sure to replace this outlet because I still have a random wire hanging around back there. Luckily, I was able to find it and get it all capped off and put a new outlet box in place and I could turn my power back on. So with that all taken care of, it was time to take measurements and then cut down my MDF panels, which will face our little surround and eventually be painted. So with Craig's help, I ran some 3 8 inch MDF through my table saw. I didn't really need his help, but he looked bored and needed something to do, so I threw him a bone and made him feel included. Anyways, once I got my MDF panels cut down, they were very easy to install because I'd already made everything square. Well, I mean, of course the side ones were easy to install because I wasn't fighting anything, but even the back one, it slid right in, just like it was supposed to. Just a little shimmy shimmy here, a little foot tap over there, tap 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 a -rooski, and boom. All my seams, nice and tight, exactly how it should have been with that back piece if the contractors had built the walls straight. But now it worked because it was square. Square. It's more of a rectangle when you make that shape with your hands, but you get the picture. With all my MDF panels in place, I simply tacked them onto my little plywood substrate with a 16 gauge brad nailer. And then it was time to trim everything out. Now because we had to shim the wall on the right, it meant that we were gonna have to do a little scribe work. So the first thing I did was cut away a little bit more of my baseboard so that my trim piece would fit nice and tight right in front of my fake wall. And you can see that it doesn't want to fit at the top, but then it's tight at the bottom because that wall's not square. Now, instead of trying to cut an entire line on the side of my trim board, I figured it'd be easier just to scribe the bottom because although the wall's not square, it seems to be tilting at least in a straight line. So instead of trying to scribe the entire height of that trim piece, I figured it'd be easier just to scribe the base, cut that at an angle on the chop saw, and then I can just trace the inside to get my exact shape that I need. So after cutting that angle on the base of my trim piece, I then cut a little bit of a back bevel on the side that's gonna go up against the wall. Now the reason I do this whenever I'm trimming out pieces that butt against walls is because it shrinks down the surface area that comes in contact with the wall and it increases the likelihood that you're going to have a tight fit right up against your wall. It looks something like this. And then when you take it inside, it looks something like this. 
See, just the very tip of that board is coming in contact with the wall, and this ensures a very nice tight fit. Now that I have a nice tight fit against my wall and my floor, all I have to do is take a pencil and trace the top to get the height that I want, and then trace that inside edge, and that will give me the exact shape that I need to cut the piece out to perfectly cap the end of my fake wall. Now that long cut is going to be cut at a taper. So the easiest way to cut a taper like this is just on the table saw. You just stick down a little double-sided tape, and then I take a piece of plywood that I already squared up by running it through the table saw. You stick one edge right on the line that you want to cut, hold it down with that double-sided tape, and send your piece of plywood through the table saw. It'll cut that perfect taper, and you should have a piece that fits perfectly onto whatever cabinet, carcass, box you're trying to trim out. As you can see, now that our piece is cut down, we can slide it in place, and boom goes the flippin' dynamite. Perfect fit. Gosh, I love it when that happens. And if you're wondering what it looks like from the top, well, wonder no further. It looks exactly like this. See, just a nice little point right up against the wall. Easy peasy. Lemon squeezy. Man, I haven't said that for a while. I'm bringing it back right now. Now that we have the right side all trimmed out, oof, that one took a while. Luckily, the left side was a breeze because that wall was already square. So we could just cut a piece to the right size and slap it on there. No real trickery going on there. Next, we had to trim out the top and cover up our, you know, MDF rib plywood situation. This one was pretty simple. I just stuck some pieces of three quarter inch MDF up there. I mitered them in the corners. I did have to play around with this one corner just a little bit because it wasn't quite 45. But then I had to measure my piece for the back. And whenever I'm measuring between two walls, the easiest thing to do is just measure out 10 inches on one side, make a mark, then you measure to that mark, you add your 10 inches to your other length, then you go cut your piece. And when you stick it in there, hopefully this doesn't happen where you set it in place and you realize it's short and then you put the tape measure on there and realize it's exactly 10 inches short and then you realize that you never added your 10 inches to your other length and you cut it 10 inches too short. Gosh, what an idiot. Lucky for me, poplar grows on trees and I had more of it. So I cut another piece, this one also with a back bevel to fit tight against that back wall. I added 10 inches to my length, and when I slid it into place, wouldn't you know, now it fits perfect. But before I hooked everything down permanently, I thought it was a good idea to run it back into my shop and sand everything. Unfortunately, I was too lazy to bring my dust extractor down from upstairs, so I just put on a mask and sanded it without a dust extractor. Once it was all sanded, I went back up into the addition, and before I hooked it to the top of my false walls, I decided to glue all my miters together just with a little CA glue and activator. This is gonna hold everything together, make sure my seams line up and that nothing's gonna move around, and then I can just attach the entire unit to the top as one giant piece. So a little spritz here, a little spray there, and my miters were all glued together. Then finally, I took that same 16 gauge nail gun and I just tacked it in place. And with that, our little fake wall surround was done. All that work just to get to the point where we could actually start building the bed. But don't worry, that's up next. Hello, this video is sponsored by Policy Genius. Now, in the shop, I'm constantly doing things to keep myself safe. I wear safety goggles, I wear a mask to protect my lungs, hearing protection to protect my ears. But one thing that people don't think about is what about protecting other parts of your life? For example, your family. Let's say the worst happens and you're not around anymore. Well, is your family taken care of? Are they protected? I'm talking about life insurance, people. Now, life insurance can be one of those things where you're like, ugh, so much work paperwork, you gotta find the right policy. But that's why Policy Genius makes it crazy easy to find the perfect policy for you. And if you don't believe me, this is how they do it. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $25 per month for a million dollars of coverage. 
Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Their licensed agents work for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over another, so you can trust their guidance. There are no added fees and your personal details are private. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. So now you might be wondering, well that's... So now you might be wondering, well that's great, but where do I go? How do I sign up? That part's incredibly easy. You just do this. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. So head to policygenius.com slash bourbonmoth or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save. So why don't you mark another thing off of your to-do list, get on policygenius.com and find with our fake wall bed surround thingamawatts it all done it was time to start building the carcass for our bed frame cabinets so i made a quick little cut list of all the plywood pieces i need and i went over to the table saw with some plywood and i bet you'll never guess what i did next i cut all the pieces that i needed for the cabinet thought that was pretty obvious now I'm gonna show you the quick and dirty way to make carcasses. This is my go-to method for putting together cabinets whenever they're sandwiched in between two solid walls and they literally can't go anywhere. I pretty much just nail and glue them together. Cause you don't have to make sure they're all secure with dados and dominoes and screws because nail and glue wedge it in there and I promise it is never gonna fall apart because it literally can't rack left to right. I mean, it's wedged between two walls. Don't overthink it, just nail it together. The cabinet carcass I'm building is gonna be made up of a few basic parts. It's gonna have two outside pieces, a middle floor panel, and some dividers. So I add some little shelves to set my bottom panel against my outside pieces. Like I said, I apply a little glue I set the base piece on the little shelf and I nail it in place. Now, of course, this is gonna bow in the middle because it's, you know, pretty wide run. So next, we're gonna take some little support pieces and we're gonna stick them underneath that middle piece. But we don't wanna stick the support pieces where our internal dividers go because we wanna be able to nail it from the bottom. This will all make sense here in a second. So anyways, I mark out where my internal dividers are gonna be so that I can avoid those. And then without a tape measure in hand or anything stupid like that, I just start shoving support pieces all over the place, adding a little glue, sliding them in there, just make sure they're somewhat evenly spaced so that your bottom's nicely supported, like a good pair of trousers. After you get them all slid in there, I go back and I tack them in place with the 16 gauge brad nailer. A boom, boom, pow. We got support now. That's your rhyme of the day. Once all of our support pieces are in place, we can flip the whole thing up on its side and now we can add our internal dividers. That's why we marked these out ahead of time. After applying a little glue to the bottom side of my internal divider piece, I stick it right on my pre-marked out line. I use a square to make sure that it's square and I nail it in from the bottom. Don't even think about it. I know that sounded funny, but Let's move on. Anyways, after I nailed it in from the bottom, I could flip the whole thing up once more. Now it's supported on the bottom side. We've got our internal dividers. We got our two outside pieces. All we need is some top support pieces. So a little more glue, a little more pieces of plywood, plop them in there, and of course, Again, with the 16 gauge brad nailer, I nail everything in place. Now, I'm not a total monster. I do take the time to make sure as I go that everything is still nice and square and it's coming together the way that it should because, you know, it is a cabinet that's got to fit in between a certain area and we don't want it to be all cattywampus. But at the same time, don't dawdle. Just get the thing together. Your carcass can be ugly. You just want your face frame to look nice, your drawer faces to look nice. Nobody will ever see the carcass. Don't waste your time on it. Once our cabinet box was all nailed and glued together, it was time to go out into the beautiful sunshine. Holy cow, and carry this thing up to the addition. I better run 
Ooh. Once I got inside and dried myself off with a towel, it was time to slide our cabinet box into place. Moment of truth, this is where you really hope all your measurements were correct and it fits how it should. Lucky for us, it fit absolutely perfect. I mean, it was tight, but it wasn't too tight. It slid right in where it wanted to be. Once I had my cabinet box in place, all I needed to do was measure from my back so that it was, you know, deep enough for my mattress and then screw it to my sides. This secured my cabinet box where it needed to be. I screwed it in on the left side and then I went over and screwed it in on the right side and it was really starting to look like a, a thing that I had made and I was quite proud of myself. Now all it needed was a face frame. So I milled up a bunch more three-quarter inch poplar until it was nice and smooth and the correct dimension. I cut it all down to the right length to cover up my cabinet box the way that I wanted. It was basically made up of a total of six pieces, these four internal dividers, my top rail and my bottom rail, and then I drilled everything out with pocket holes so that I could screw it all together. And then I did just that. I, I screwed it all together because it's a face frame. And again, don't overthink it. It'll look great. Once it was all screwed together, again, I pulled out my sander. Yes, my dust collector is still upstairs and I'm still too lazy to bring it down. So I put on a mask and I sanded down my face frame. Now, theoretically, my face frame should fit just as well as my cabinet box but things don't always go to plan. This was a little bit tighter than I would have liked, but I just used a hammer and a paint stick so I didn't mar up my face frame and I was able to tap it nice and tight against my cabinet boxes. Now I could have added pocket holes to my cabinet boxes so there was no nail holes in my face frame, but it's gonna be painted. So once I fill the holes, you're not gonna see them and I was in a hurry. Next, I added another piece of plywood on the back of the cabinet box because I had it and I figured, what the heck? And then we needed to extend that box around the back of our surround so that we had a little ledge for our plywood base plate to sit that would eventually support our mattress. So using a level and a 16 gauge brad nailer, once again, to tack everything in place, once I had it situated where I wanted, I went back with some inch and a half long screws just to make it a little more sturdy. And then it was time to install our drawer slides. As always, I'm using Bloom undermount drawer slides. If you're wondering where the heck are you getting these drawer slides, we'll just go to rockaler.com. They always seem to have drawer slides in stock. It's my favorite place to get them. And they usually come the same week that I ordered them. After my drawer slides were in place, I took my measurements for my drawer boxes. And then I went and made some drawer boxes, you know, because that seemed like the natural next step. And if you're saying, hey, whoa, back up, how did you make these? Well, I have an entire video showing you exactly just how I make drawer boxes. So instead of wasting your time in this video, just click that little tab in the top of the video up there and you can go watch that video later on. After my drawer boxes were all constructed, I added the little bloom clips that also came from Rockler with my drawer slides. It's like a package deal. Everything you need for the drawer slides just comes together. Anyways, and all I had to do was click them in place. That's why I use undermount drawer slides. They're so crazy easy to install. And if you're wondering how to install them, yes, I have another video just on installing drawer slides. Pat myself on the back for thinking ahead. Now the really cool part about this build is although I was gonna do shaker style drawer faces, my wife said she just wanted flat panels, which definitely saved me a lot of time because all I had to do was cut down some pieces of high density fiberboard, three quarter inch, and stick them in there. Really, world's simplest drawer faces. I spaced them all out with some playing cards to get my reveals nice, and then I screwed them in through the drawer box into the drawer face from the back. That's why I haven't put my plywood topper on yet. I wanted to get my drawer faces installed first because it would be much easier to install those before my plywood topper was on. Now, I did have this giant void behind the drawers, and I thought it was kind of a waste of space, and I wanted to do something cool with it. 
So I found this old Halloween decoration skeleton. It always scares the crap out of me every time I go up in the attic. And because I was tired of being scared, I decided that I'll just put it in here and close the lid. Then one day, maybe 50 or 60 years from now, when somebody else owns our house and they decide to tear out this bed, well, at least they'll get a fun little surprise. And that'll teach them to tear out the bed I spent all this time on. Jerks. So with the skeleton that my son had named Lazarus in place, I cut a piece of three quarter inch plywood for my topper and very carefully I slid it in place. Again, this was much, much easier now that I had squared everything up. Goodbye, Lazarus. May you sleep long and well. And may the person that finds you, at least for a moment, think that you're real. Because <laughs> that would be hilarious. Now we're getting pretty close to having this bed all put together. There's just a few more things we needed to do. Next, I tacked my plywood down. Again, we don't need glue or screws. It's not going anywhere. It's gonna have a mattress sitting on top of it. But we do need to cover up this exposed plywood edge. So I ripped down a piece of poplar to an inch and a half. This will cover up the plywood edge and give us a little three quarter of an inch lip on the top just to keep the mattress from, you know, sliding off the front if someone was getting a little ruckus. So I added a little glue. I wedged my poplar trim piece in place and again, I just tacked it in with a 16 gauge brad nailer. I'll come back and fill all those nail holes later. Now we were really close to having this thing all put together. There was just one more thing that my wife wanted me to do. And that was rip down a bunch of tiny little strips of MDF on the table saw. An inch and a half wide to be exact. And I mean a bunch of them. After I had all these strips ripped down, I went over and I cut them to length on the miter saw. Now if you're still confused as to why I need all these strips, well, don't worry, I'll tell you right now. I went over to the oscillating belt sander and I just, you know, softened the edges of them. So hopefully that'll clear things up. No, in all seriousness, what these are are just some added little decoration trim pieces that she wanted me to put around the false wall surround area. You know, kind of like a little batten type look to give it a little more depth, make it feel a little more cozy. You know, have something to run your hands across in the night as you sleep. I don't know, but it does make it look pretty good. I will give her that. Good one, wife. To hook these little pieces on, I just used some glue and my 23 gauge nailer because it's pretty invisible and you can't really even see the holes in it, which is nice, less work for me. And then of course I had to sand everything down. Now luckily I have this Festool sander with a point on it, which is perfect for doing stuff like this because it's really easy to get in all the nooks and crannies. And once everything was sanded down, I had to do my all-time favorite thing, which was paint it. Now, to tell you the truth, I hate sanding, but painting somehow is a little different, especially when I do it this way, where I just paint by hand with a brush. Yes, it takes a long time, but there's something soothing and, I don't know, methodic about it. The way I like to paint stuff is using a method called rolling and tipping. So it's a combination of using a roller to get the paint onto the surface like this. The problem is when you use a roller, it leaves the texture of the roller onto the piece and you don't really get a smooth finish. It just looks like a rolled paint finish, which isn't great. But the tipping method is when you come back with a paintbrush after you roll it and you tip that paint out. You're basically smoothing out all of that texture left behind by the roller, getting rid of any air bubbles, and you can actually get a very nice smooth surface and you don't have to get out your paint sprayer. Eventually the foreman stopped by and he wanted to show me how you're actually supposed to do it. So he painted for a total of, I don't know, three seconds and then he gave up and made me do the rest of it while he mocked me. But he's cute, so he can get away with it, I guess. The problem is though, he knows he's cute and that's dangerous. 
In no time, I managed to get one coat on the entire thing, and after that dried, wouldn't you believe it, I put on a second coat. I did, I'm not lying. And after I got that second coat on, it was time to peel off my tape. Lucky for me, my wife opted for no texture on the walls in our new addition, so I got a nice crisp line all the way around the top. That evening, after letting the paint cure up a little bit more, I reinstalled the drawer faces onto all my drawer boxes, made sure they were sliding nice and smooth, which they were, and it was all really starting to come together. There was just a few final touches. That was installing this unlacquered brass hardware that my wife got from Rejuvenation, and of course, sliding the mattress up onto the bed. And there you have it. In only a few days, I managed to get this entire thing built, installed, and painted. It filled in that little nook in our addition perfectly, and now we have this daybed where people can lounge around and read or hang out, take a nap, and it'll be perfect if guests ever want to stop by. So if you're ever in my neighborhood, just come knock on my door. I'll call the police because I don't know you, and I'll be like, how the heck did you get my address? Do you have a gun? Are you going to kill me? But after the police arrest you, you know, maybe we'll get to know each other and become friends, and then you can come stay at my house. I mean, I, I doubt it, but hey, weirder things have happened.